I invite you to turn again in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 3. Father, by your Spirit, sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. We look to Jesus, the word became flesh. And we pray all this in his precious name. Amen. Sisyphus is a well-known figure in Greek mythology, primarily because of the punishment that he received at the hands of Zeus. He was notoriously cunning and crafty, and on multiple occasions, Sisyphus actually cheated death and was able to escape the underworld. But Sisyphus' escape from the underworld was short-lived because he's caught by Zeus and sentenced to a punishment that is far worse, worse than the death that he was able to escape. Zeus forces him to, to roll a massive boulder up a hill. But every time that Sisyphus rolls the boulder up the hill, he finds that he loses his grasp at the very top and the ball rolls back down the hill. He is forced to face an eternity of meaningless struggle, pushing a boulder up a hill, only to have it fall back down for all of eternity. He's sentenced to a lifelong struggle of meaningless pain and seemingly needless endurance. Philosophers throughout history have argued that the myth of Sisyphus is much more than folklore. Many believe that this is the plight of the human experience. They would say that our lives are marked with meaningless suffering, just a process of endlessly pushing a stone up a hill until our lives meet their end. I hope that this morning you would reject such a nihilistic and hopeless view of the world, but I wonder if you might be able to empathize with why a person might actually come to that conclusion. And as you hear the story of Sisyphus, you think, I actually think I know a little bit of what it's like to feel like Sisyphus. Because we look at the struggles of our lives and you push stones of chronic pain, you push the stone of a broken marriage or a dysfunctional family, the stones of crippling anxiety or depression, and you feel like your life is marked by these meaningless struggles and you can't see why they're happening and they just come into your life over and over again. And when we're honest, we say these doubts and these questions creep into my mind and I ask, why is this even happening? Does God know that this is happening? Does he care that this is happening? If God loved me, why would he sentence me to this endless struggle of seemingly endless struggle and pain and suffering. <coughs> I don't plan on answering any of those questions this morning with a kind of sunny optimism that asks you to push aside those questions or to push down your pain or to disregard it as something to just numb uh, with distractions or comfort or empty platitudes this morning. I want you to know that the struggle that's described in the story of Sisyphus is a very real struggle that we experience in our lives. And I want you to know that the Bible doesn't actually disregard that struggle either. The Bible has answers and actually provides us hope in the seemingly meaningless struggles of our lives. Dane Ortland writes this in one of his books. He says, there is for all of us living between the first two chapters of the Bible and the last two, a pervasive futility shot through everything. Our minds, our hearts, our consciences, every thought and word and meeting and email and rising to another day, there's something hard to articulate that infects it all. A sense of loss, of frustration, of non-flourishing, of shutdown, of daily grinding aimlessness, of spinning our wheels and constantly hitting a wall. We're like a beautiful car trying to get from point A to point B with an engine and interior parts under the hood all gunked up. We're not running as we should. In Hebrews 12 this morning, I hope that you will see that God's word tells us that the gospel provides us hope and meaning that cuts through the pervasive futility of life. And I want you to see that in Jesus, there is hope that transcends the Sisyphean struggle that we face in our lives. And the gospel actually imbues our suffering and struggle with meaning and hope. We'll consider this under three headings this morning. The first being the inspiration for the weary, 
Secondly, discipline for the weary. And thirdly, holiness for the weary, healing for the weary. So inspiration for the weary, discipline for the weary, and healing for the weary. We'll begin in verses three and four and we'll see this inspiration that is provided for the weary. In verse three, we'll see that after what we considered last uh, week in verses one and two, there's this call to run this race of endurance that's launched out of this long chapter of repetition of those who have lived by faith. Verse three is like a hinge verse connecting the exhortation of verses one and two to now the present concern that the author has for these believers who are struggling and who are facing the challenge of weariness. Verses one and two introduce this athletic metaphor, a metaphor of running a race, the race of faith. That idea of running a race carries through the rest of this morning as we'll consider the challenge of weariness when we're running the sense of exhaustion. Those phrases, grow weary and lose heart, are terms that are specifically meant to communicate exhaustion. They're terms that would be used actually to describe runners who have physically collapsed at the end of a race. And so the author is writing these verses out of concern in this call to endure for these believers who are struggling. He sees believers who are getting a little bit wobbly and they're growing weary. Have you ever been to a race, not as a runner, but as a spectator? Whether it's been a 5K, a cross country race, uh, a marathon. I've been able to actually see a few of my friends and family uh, run in marathons and been there uh, to cheer them on and to see them finish the race. I'm always so encouraged to see uh, whether it's just young families or spouses or friends who are there to cheer their friends on through such a challenging um, attempt at a physical feat. Um, one of the things that I find especially endearing is the well-intentioned but irrational encouragement that comes from friends and family from the sidelines. I'm at a marathon and I'm watching these people finish and I hear this wife call out, Craig, you're looking great. And then I look over and Craig looks like he got run over by a truck <laughs> and he's shuffling at one mile per hour. And I'm thinking, Craig's not looking good at all. <laughs> and his kid's like, Dad, you're almost there. I'm like, kid, your dad has 17 miles left to run. <laughs> Do not jump the gun here. Be careful of people in your life when you're growing weary who call out to you with well-intentioned but superficial encouragements. See, when I'm shuffling at one mile per hour in my life and I'm growing weary, the last thing that I need to hear is you can do it. Believe in yourself. Tap into the power of positive thinking. Because when I'm struggling and I'm shuffling my feet and I can't push any longer, the truth is that I can't do it. This appeal for me to look inside myself and draw out some kind of inner strength to believe that I can do it, to believe that I'm good enough, it's simply not true. If I look within when I'm weary and when I'm struggling, for some kind of strength, the only thing that I find inside of me is more weakness and more weariness. <coughs> See, the further I dig down, the further I will spiral into this weariness. I don't have the necessary resources to endure. If it's up to me, if it's up to you, we're not gonna make it. The author to the Hebrews, as he sees these believers who have slowed down from a run to a shuffle, they're dragging their feet and they're muttering to themselves, I'm not gonna be able to finish. I can't do this. The author to the Hebrews calls out from the sidelines and tells them the one thing that they do need to hear. That he doesn't say believe in yourself, he says consider Jesus. He says don't look inside yourself, look outside of yourself. Look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. When you look to Jesus, the perfect example and the perfect object of your faith, you'll see that Jesus actually endured this great hostility that is beating you down, that is causing you to be so horribly weary. And then you keep looking at Jesus and you keep considering him and you realize that he actually suffered, he ran this exact path that you're struggling on and he actually struggled to the furthest extent. See, whatever weariness that you're going through right now, you haven't yet struggled to the, 
point of martyrdom. You haven't actually come to the point of shedding blood is what the author tells us. And he says, but Jesus did. And so as we look to Jesus, we look to him ahead of us, and when we're saying, I can't go any further, I'm done, he says, look to Jesus. And don't say, I can do it. Remember, Jesus already did it. And when I consider Jesus, you know where I see him? I see him at the finish line, and he's bloodied, but he's victorious. So consider Jesus. Look beyond yourself and outside of yourself when you're struggling. And then if we look to Jesus, who is this suffering savior, this one who goes before us, he's the author and perfecter of our faith, and he's done so by charting out this path of suffering, when suffering does actually come into our lives and when we're tempted towards weariness, we won't be surprised by it, but we'll actually expect it, expect it. And we'll go, this is actually the way of Jesus. This is actually an honor. First Peter 2, verse 21 says, if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. So consider Jesus. Then and only then will you find the strength, the inspiration, and the motivation to take just another step. So this is inspiration for the weary. We'll move secondly into verses five through nine and we'll see discipline for the weary. So to consider Jesus is our motivation, and we'll see in verses five through nine that God uses this weariness and these difficulties to actually train us to endure through the weariness. He quotes Proverbs three, verse 11 here in verses five and six. He says, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Understand the picture that the author is painting here. He's looking to God and he's showing us that he relates to us as a father, which means that the way that God deals with his people is he deals with us as sons and daughters. There's a parental relationship that exists between us and God. And that relationship extends to the very worst things in our lives. A book was written a couple of years ago by two authors, Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt. They wrote a book entitled The Coddling of the American Mind. These two authors set, set out to diagnose what they saw as a problem that existed in American culture. They saw a generation of young people who were seemingly more anxious, more depressed, uh, less mature, less capable, and more lost than generations before. They argued that this occurred because a generation of parents had bought into what they referred to as the untruth of fragility. They define this untruth of fragility essentially with the statement That's, that what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. It's the idea that a generation of well-intentioned parents went to increasingly great lengths to shield and shelter their children from anything that would be difficult anything that would cause them, cause them suffering or pain, to avoid insults, challenges, and painful experience, experiences. Now this well-intentioned desire to protect and shelter these children from life's most difficult things, the authors argue that this actually resulted in these children being deprived of necessary stressors, things that they needed to actually develop maturity, to develop resilience, to be created within them the resilience that comes to navigate the challenges of life eventually when they wouldn't have their parents to shelter them. As the old saying goes, we ought to prepare the child for the road, not the road for the child. Now as we think about this mentality when it comes to parenting, a father to a son or a mother to a daughter, as we try to care for our children, is it possible that this mentality, this untruth of fragility, that somehow we project that kind of thinking on God as our heavenly father when we think about the way that he deals with us? That when hard things come into our lives, we say to God, if you really love me, wouldn't you protect me from these things? Wouldn't you prevent failure from coming my way? Why aren't you clearing the road for me so that I don't have to run into all these difficult circumstances? 
if God loved me, why wouldn't he take care of these difficult things and remove them from my life? Have you considered that God, being a good father, actually uses the challenges in your life to actually produce something in you, to create resilience, to actually equip you and enable you and train you to have the resilience that you need to get through difficult things? Verse seven, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? J.B. Phillips' paraphrase says this uh, for the second half of that verse, no true son grows up uncorrected by his father. It's a very simple picture here. For those of us with, with children, either young children now or young children in the past, when our kids run out towards the street, do we lay back in our chairs and say, I'm so glad that Billy is beginning to express himself and to do what makes him happy? No, we chase after our kids and we yank them back from the street. We speak sternly to them. We correct their behavior because we love them. Because we want to correct behavior that's actually going to lead to destruction, to pain, to further suffering. And when we pull our kids back from the street, they cry and they tell us they, that they hate us. And five minutes later, they run right back out into the street again. It's a simple picture of a parental desire to see what is best for our children. God disciplines comes to us as his sons and as his daughters that we might be kept from what will destroy us and trained into what will most prosper us. Thomas Watson says, God's rod of affliction is a pencil to draw Christ's image more lively upon us. He disciplines us as sons so that we might become more like his perfect son, Jesus. And I want you to know that when we do cry when God disciplines us, when the difficult things in our life comes, God does not tell us to have a stiff upper lip and to deal with it because he's putting us through spiritual boot camp. No, God is near to the brokenhearted and he saves the crushed in spirit. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoking flax he will not quench. In Jesus, we have this merciful high priest who sympathizes with us, who knows what it's like to feel pain, who wept at the grave of Lazarus, who emotionally cares deeply about you. And it's because we have this merciful high priest that we're actually able to approach our God as Father. It's because of him, because he stands as a mediator and he's drawn us in and adopted us into this family. We who were once fatherless orphans, we've now been welcomed into this family where we have a father who cares for us and who gives us what's best. That wasn't the case before Jesus pulled us into this family. But now we have a father who disciplines us and cares for us. And even when the worst suffering in our life hurts, we can trust that God is good and that even when it doesn't make sense, God is a good father who disciplines us. He disciplines me. John Flavel puts it this way, if you're in Christ and God is your father, you lie too close to his heart for him to hurt you. That is the comfort that we have in the worst afflictions in our lives. You lie too close to the heart of the father for him to ever do anything that ultimately isn't for your good. How many of us can look back at the rules that were imposed on us as children? How many of us are foolish enough to go, I wish my dad would have let me run into the street. I wish he would have just not bothered me while I was in middle school and high school. He should have let me do all the stupid things that I was doing. He should have just let me be myself. Anyone who has even a shred of wisdom know that that's not the case. We look back and we're thankful for our parents. We're thankful for the things that they kept us from doing that protected us, that nurtured us, that trained us and disciplined us to be the people who we are today, especially our believing parents who trained us up in the way that we should go, who charted out this path for us that we didn't wanna walk down, who made us sit through family meetings after lunch every day and go through a devotional Bible study that I didn't want to go to. I'm getting a little too personal here. <laughs> but I'm thankful 
because it laid a foundation that I initially rejected, but now I look back and I go, thank you, mom, thank you, dad. You produced something in me that otherwise I wouldn't have had. We're grateful for this because we know that our parents love us. How much more does a heavenly father's training for us, even when we reject it, even when we hate it, ultimately work for our good? Submit yourselves to the providence of God through the worst things in your life and trust that he knows best. You and I will never do this, what's called of us in chapter 12, if we don't first believe chapter 11, that we live by faith, that I have this conviction and assurance of things that I hope for, of things that are set before me that I can't see. In the moment, suffering is just horrible and painful and I can't understand why, but I live by faith that God is good, that he's never broken a promise, and that for those who love God, all things work together for good. You have to believe that by faith. God disciplines us and he trains us. This discipline, in our second point, is the means by which God brings about the ends of healing for the weary, which is our third point. We have inspiration for the weary, training for the weary, now healing for the weary in verses 10 through 13. In Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Harry is wandering about uh, the castle, Hogwarts, where he goes to school, and he's looking through uh, the classes uh, and the rooms, and he stumbles upon this mysterious mirror in one of the classrooms. When he looks into the mirror, he doesn't just see an ordinary reflection. He actually sees himself, but alongside of him are his long-lost parents, and around them, his extended family. He goes to find his best friend, Ron, uh, and he wants to show him uh, his, this reflection that he's found of his parents. But when Ron comes to the mirror, Ron doesn't see Harry's parents. Ron actually sees himself as head boy in the school, and he's standing above and apart from all of his brothers. When Harry inquires with the wise Professor Dumbledore about uh, what, what's going on with this mirror, Dumbledore tells him that this is the mirror of Erised. And Dumbledore explains that this is a mirror that in which when you look into it, you will see nothing less than the deepest and most desperate desires of your heart. Only the happiest man on earth could use this as a normal mirror, looking into it and seeing himself exactly as he is. If you looked into that mirror, what would you see looking back at you? What's the deepest desire and the greatest longing of your heart? Is it to be married? Is it uh, to get into a certain college? Is it to make partner at your firm? Is it to have healthy grandchildren? Whatever those deepest desires and longings of your heart that you might have, I think if you're willing to answer that question honestly, and to actually search your heart and to think, what is my greatest desire? I think you'll begin to understand why it is that suffering can be so difficult and why it can make us so weary. It's because in our suffering, God is often taking away from us or keeping us from the things that appear in that mirror. God seems to be taking away the thing that you want the most, the thing that, you th that makes you happy the thing that you desire and long for the most. Dumbledore actually warned Harry about that mirror. He said, Harry, men have wasted away before this mirror, not knowing if what they've seen is real or even possible. Some of us are wasting away before our deepest longings and desires, questioning God, doubting that he's good because he's not giving us the things that we want the most, the things that we believe will make us happy. But what if God has something better in mind for you than the things that you think will make you happy? What if in removing the things that you want the most, God has actually something better in store for you? That's what we learn here in this point. Look at verse 10. God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. He disciplines us for our good that we might share in his holiness. Friends, our greatest good is not to have the things that make us the happiest. It's to go through the things that make us the holiest. 
Your greatest good is not to have a bunch of things that make you happy. Your greatest good is to look in that mirror and to see the reflection of Jesus looking back at you. Because that's what you and I were created for, made in the image of God to perfectly reflect his goodness and his character in every aspect of our lives. And that's what we have in Jesus, the perfect image of God. And that's the hope that we have as believers that by one degree of glory to the next, we are being transformed into the image and likeness of Jesus. We're being recreated in Christ to be who God made us to be. And so that is our greatest good. That is our purpose. That is the chief end of why God made us. And so that's our greatest good. But here's the challenging thing is that so often the way that God makes us look like Jesus is by taking away the things that distract us from Jesus. Things that aren't even necessarily bad, but the things that we hold so tightly to that it's preventing us from laying hold of Jesus. God removes those things from us in order that we might learn to lean on him more. And that is so very painful. Verse 11, for the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained for it. As Christians, we're not masochists. We don't talk about this discipline and this suffering like some person who just enjoys going through pain. We recognize that it's difficult. There's nothing good about the brokenness of life apart from what God does in redeeming that brokenness. As Christians, we can know without a, shadow of our God, uh, without a shadow of a doubt that God uses bad things and he redeems them and uses them for good. And we count it all joy when we encounter trials of various kinds because we know that although those trials and those difficulties are still bad things, that God leverages them and uses them to produce something in us, to produce endurance, to produce a steadfastness of faith and he removes all those other things, those unstable things that we lean on so that we might fall into the arms of Jesus. And when this happens, we find that when we go through this fire that feels like it's burning us, what's really happening is the dross is being melted away from us so that we might be purified and refined that we might look more like Jesus. Tim Keller writes these words about how the Christian approaches suffering uh, with genuine optimism. There are the good things of this world, the hard things of this world, and the best things of this world. God's love and glory and holiness and beauty. The Bible's teaching is that the road to the best things is not through the good things, but usually through the hard things, as Jesus himself shows us. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God might have the best things for you and that he just wants you to go through the hard things so that you might get to those best things? Even though you so desperately want to just stay with the good things? If you believe that and you are weary and weak this morning because you're in the middle of the hard things, lift your eyes to Jesus and then lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. See, if you don't know Jesus this morning, the hardest things in life will crush you. Life doesn't discriminate between the sinners and the saints. It takes and it takes and it takes. But in the gospel, there is provided for us a healing that transcends the futility of life, a healing that is freely offered to those who are weary and weak. So this morning, if you limped into this auditorium and you've got nothing left and you're saying, I can't go any any further, I can't do it anymore, I invite you to fall into the arms of Jesus who says to you, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Father, we look to you as the one who has sent your son, whose example is our motivation, 
the one to whom we look when we're feeling weary. We look to you as our Father who trains us and disciplines us through difficult things, through painful things. We look to you as the one who heals us and gives us hope that pulls us through these painful things and actually takes our, our weakness and our weariness and strengthens us through it. Thank you for the way that for each of us who are in Jesus, you're using these difficult things in our life to purify us and to make us into the image of your perfect son, Jesus. We pray all these things in his name, amen.